Hey everyone, welcome to the first edition of Nalcon Online Conference 2021. We are super excited with talks and activities throughout the month of March with various CTFs, workshops, trainings, and resume clinic for all of you in the InfoSec community. I'm super proud to host this event this year with more than 53 uh, countries uh, participation from. Last, uh, oops, okay. Last year on the same day, uh, we organized Nalcon physically in Goa. Seeing that we have been engaging with the InfoSec community and industry throughout COVID-19 by organizing various sessions like webinars, CTS, workshops, and a lot more. We have also successfully completed trainings uh, online in the last four days. Uh, we had more than 300 participations spread across 13 different trainings and a lot of happy faces at the end of the training. So let's get started now. Uh, the schedule for today is going to be have one keynote, four technical talks and one panel session. I hope you all enjoy the enormous amount of knowledge that our speakers have to share with you all. Our first keynote for the day is none other than Casey Ellis. India dominates the world when it comes to number of bug bounty hunters and payouts. None other than Casey, who is the founder and the chairman of Buck Crowd would know more. He's a dear friend who I know since 2014, when we did the first bug bounty, I think we call it the bug bash uh, in Nalgorn. Uh, he would be sharing his insights on views related to security research and disclosures, the unauthorized biography. Some house rules, please keep your mics on mute. If you have any questions that you would like to ask our speakers, please send them across via the Zoom chat. I will be moderating them and we will take them after the speaker's presentation is complete. Now let me hand it over to Casey to deliver his keynote. Thank you so much. Good morning, uh, India. Good morning, Nalcon. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, firstly, before we get going, I just wanted to say that I was incredibly honored to uh, to get the invitation to speak. Um, you know, it, it's been just a phenomenal relationship that we've had with with, with India and the hacking community there uh, over the years with Bugcrowd and, you know, personally uh, for, for a lot of the team, including myself uh, prior to that as well. Um, you know, you all have this incredible capacity and potential uh, and, and you're seeing it like there's there's incredible success happening out of the bug hunter community uh, across the board. Um, you know, for, for I speak for myself and Ashish Gupta, uh, the CEO at, uh, at Bug Crowd, you know, Hacklu, Kadingo, all the other usual suspects. When we say that we're really honored to be a part of uh, of, of connecting you all uh, to uh, to the opportunity and, and a small part of that because you all come in and do the work and, and make it awesome. So thank you very much. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to be here today. And without further ado let's do the awkward part where i start sharing and i have to remember how to do that covid 19 man i'll tell you what so yeah <clears throat> here we go so the uh, the talk is um uh, uh, that that as well it's uh yeah the, the, this is actually my first nalcon presenting uh with you know bugcrowd supported nalcon for many years um i have not been there physically for the conference yet it is still very much on the to-do list um i i figured uh you know, doing it virtually. I mean, it's not as good as being there on the ground with all you all you folk, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll take it anyway. So let's get started. So the talk today is security research uh, and disclosure. I'm seeing the thumbs up. Um, the unauthorized biography. Um, really, what we're going to talk through is is kind of you know a bit of a history of how we got to where we are today. You know, what the market is doing and and what that means in terms of being able to spot opportunity coming over the horizon. Uh, you know, some of the things that uh, that bug hunters and people involved in security research can think about to to really, you know, maximize their potential, maximize their opportunity going forward, just ways to think about how they direct their effort, because there's a lot of stuff, right? And I think uh, being able to choose and, and find the things that are most, you know, powerful and exciting for you, but also that are going to be most valuable in the market is, is a really interesting thing to start thinking about. So who am I? Um, I, I just got a glowing uh set up there so i won't go too much further into it i do have the the hack hustle uh the hack hustle kind of persona split um so my background is actually as a pen tester offensive security person moved into solutions architecture became an entrepreneur and eventually started bug crowd uh, which was about nine years ago now um so there's you know casey in the suit and then casey kind of blurry you know saying mean things to people on twitter about security it's um 
it's an interesting duality to carry, but it's, I think, a part of what I enjoy most about my job. So yeah, founder, uh, chairman, and CTO of Bug Crowd, um, also the founder of the Disclose.io project. Um, yeah, I've just been through my background. So about 20 years in InfoSec, I got into this straight out of high school. I mean, I was hacking the whole time as a kid, but pretty much started getting into it um, as, a, as a job uh, as soon as I finished high school, um, quite by accident, to be honest, but it's turned out pretty well. So I'm not regretting that. Um, so yeah, pioneered the, uh, the the crowdsource security as a service model. We're not the inventors of vulnerability disclosure of bug bounty programs, but there wasn't anyone else doing it when we started. So, you know, as as far as our role in in basically taking this to something that's I think considered quite normal now, um, incredibly proud of that. I think one of the big things that I have is just you know removing the demonization of, of hackers in, in in the minds of people uh, i think folks just in general they're very familiar with the concept of burglars and locksmiths um, i think the digital equivalent that we have online is, is a bit more new to people so you know we've put a lot of effort into trying to get people to understand that and i feel like it's been you know a, a pretty good success over the past period of time um i'm a husband father and there's sorry i'm just on a call thank you no it's all good so I'm literally in Brisbane for CrikeyCon as well right now. So I'm doing this from a hotel. We told housekeeping not to come and they've just come. So there we go, doing it live, COVID style. Um, Australian husband, father of two. I'm normally in San Francisco. We actually bugged out to come back to Australia to be close to family ahead of COVID and we're still here. I'm looking forward to getting back there uh, once things kind of clear up and get a bit safer. So agenda, all right, how did we get here? What is my opportunity? How can I seize it? I've already laid that up, but really that sort of lays out what we're gonna be talking about today. But first, Thank you all. Um, I preempted this a little bit as well in the intro uh, and, and thanks for the invite to do the keynote, but yeah, India has been an absolute powerhouse right from, from the get-go. Um, in, in 2019, these stats are from the uh, Inside the Mind of a Hacker report the Bug Crowd published last year. 34% of all of our payouts went to India and we saw an 83% growth in participation on the platform. It was like all of a sudden, you know, a whole bunch of folk thought, oh, like the Nullcon crew seem cr cool, let's join in with those guys, like get involved in security and start participating in programs. Um, and, you know, as I said before, like we're, we're, we're honored to play like the role that we play in, in, in being able to connect you all to opportunity and, and help you be a part of this broader mission of making the internet a safer place. That's, you know, the fact that we get to do that, think like bad guys, not be bad guys, actually do good things and make money in the process, I think is pretty, is a pretty cool feature of what we get to do here. So thank you. Uh, and greets to Farris, Streak, Cyberboy, um, who was one of the original hunters on the platform from way back in the day, uh, and the rest of the Bug Crowd India crew over there as well. All right, how to get here. <clears throat> um, when I was, uh, a couple of years back, I was riding in a lift in San Francisco, and um, the driver was was Sudanese. He'd, he'd immigrated to, 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 to the US, and we were talking about security and just risk and different things like that, because you know, it's just idle chat uh, with me invariably turns into a conversation about that type of thing. Um, and he just trotted out this incredible phrase, which I've, which I've promptly stolen from him. I'd love to try to find that guy so I can go back and actually give him proper credit. But this is literally how that went down. It's like all security is the product of something bad happening, um, which is kind of a dark way to think about it, right? But honestly, it's, it's also sort of true. Uh, when, you, when you think about people building a business, they're not building it to not get hacked. They're building it to do the thing that the business wants to do. The fact that they're, induce, they're introducing vulnerability and weakness and, and risk in the process is not necessarily something that they're doing on purpose. It's just not the thing that they're most focused on, right? So it takes bad things oftentimes for people to realize that there's an issue um, so that they can start to reduce that risk. Um, and the thing is that, um, you know, there's really two versions of bad things that can happen. There's the actual bad things, which I'm gonna go through a list of. Um, but then there's also the, the version of bad things that can happen when people with a breaker mindset, like the folk listening to this talk, come in and actually show in good faith what can be done, what's possible, what needs to be fixed. Ultimately, I think you know, breakers in that breaker mindset um, is really a principal driver of innovation right across the board. Like builders build stuff, they have ideas, they take things forward, but then this breaker mindset comes in and tests all of the assumptions that have been created provides it feedback and then you just grow and improve and amazing things happen as a part of that. And that creates opportunity. So let's talk about some examples of that. Um, yeah, the technology here, uh, the innovation was unbreakable locks. This is what we credit as the first security bug bounty that we can find ever. Um, 
uh, what happened was a, a company basically put out, a, I think it was a 50,000 US dollar equivalent in today's currency reward in, in the 1850s um, at the World Fair to see if anyone could break this unbreakable lock. And it was a marketing stunt. They actually didn't think it was possible. But then this guy named Charles Hobbs came in and showed them that it was. Um, the result of that was it it basically there was a bunch of papers that were created out of that and it became like this really seminal moment <clears throat> in physical security where there was a lot of improvement that was actually catalyzed by someone who came in and thought differently right another example c um you know lf1 smashing the stack for fun and profit buffer overflows are they didn't magically go away after after this paper um far from it to be honest uh but it was really this seminal moment of thinking about how to abuse the stack in, in, in context of a binary and that sort of construct. Um, you know, the impact of that was was obviously the, the creation, the exploitation of buffer overflows. Like later on, you had things like, uh, you know, Slammer, Blaster, Nimda, some of the like major like internet wide worms. I mean, even WannaCry um, more recently, they've all taken advantage of this type of thing. You know, the result of that has been like ASLR, you know, DEP, NX, all of these kind of memory protection uh, implementations that continue to improve. And as a result, have actually made some of the software that he was talking about back then, some of the most secure software that exists today. So another example of breakers making things better. Uh, this one's fun. Uh, Sammy, the guy, uh, the, the, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, and also he is my hero. Um, his his uh, worm, and this was an interesting one because it, yeah, I think it, when he tells the story of how this all went down, for him it was more of a proof of concept. It wasn't necessarily good faith or bad faith. He was just kind of noodling on a thing and he went away, came back to his computer a couple of hours later and the internet had basically melted at that point. Um, this really was one of the seminal moments in the creation of uh, application security as a discipline across the board. Because prior to that, you know, oh, what can go wrong? Like Web 2.0, user-generated content, everything's going to be fine. Sammy comes in and actually demonstrates some of the risks that can happen around that. And all of a sudden, we've got this incredible industry today. It's a, it's a big part of you know, what we see um, our customers and, and the hackers on our platform engage with is web stuff, right? And this is, this is one of the areas that really precipitated that and drove it forward. This one's weirder. This is actually machine learning. Um, and, and I'll come back to this later. Um, <clears throat> but machine learning as, as a thing that is just this incredible innovation that came out, then all of a sudden someone abused it. This was a uh, the, the great flash crash of, of 2010. If you're interested in machine learning, I really encourage looking it up because it's fascinating <clears throat> as a story. Um, basically, that dip there that you can see is a trillion dollars. Uh, and, and that happened over the course of, of 30 minutes. There was an abuse case that was fed into a whole set of ML constructs and it caused the stock market to completely basically explode at that point in time. Um, you know, the innovation or the improvement out of that, uh, not a whole lot really, because the market likes to make money. So it didn't do too much about changing traders and their ability to, to, to facilitate that. <clears throat> but what it did do was, was basically trigger the creation of policy uh, and, and other things to make the market more resilient to that type of deal. Here's another one that's a favorite, uh, Recon, right? Um, so, you know, I think the research that really got this going, the fact that people don't know where their stuff is, is not a new concept. That's That's been, I think, something that, you know, people in the scene have been aware of for a very long time. And it's been this kind of unsolved problem. Uh, we solved it internally for, for networks that we know the boundaries of, but as we started to move to cloud and the whole idea of, you know, the computer being out there over the public internet somewhere, all of a sudden, we lost track of where our stuff was. Um, Nafi and Shoves came in and did a whole bunch of research, actually driven by by bug bounty hunting, to figure out how to identify assets that had been lost effectively by the user. <clears throat> and and really, the impact of that was was this, um, I think, kind of simultaneous awareness across uh, defenders and builders that yeah, I actually don't know where my stuff is. Um, that was always true, but they didn't really know that. So so this demonstrated that. Since then, you know, perimeter asset inventory is, is now a category. Um, attack surface management is a category. This sort of you know set of techniques and set of things that hunters can do has driven a lot of success in the bug hunter community, and, and things are improving as a result. Um, I've got two more, and then we'll get into the the other side of this, like how how I think the business builders have been viewing all of this. Um, connected auto. Uh, I know this is near and dear to the to the hardware IO crew. 
um, you know, really the innovation was putting the internet in cars. We want features, we want things to, to, to be cool, you know, as we're using the vehicle. We actually want this like fancy internet connected stuff as a part of our driving experience because it makes it better. Um, Charlie and Chris rock up and basically say, hey, you forgot security. Uh, what that did was basically precipitated, we're actually, Bug Crab was quite close to the coalface on this one because what that did was triggered the entire auto, automotive industry to realize we need help. Um, where can we find hackers and hunters and people with a break of mindset to come in and tell us how to better secure our products? Because this is going to become a safety issue. If, if we get to autonomous vehicles before we figured out how to secure the connected car, that's a bad time. So we need to get on top of this right now. And, uh, you know, Fiat Chrysler, like Tesla, uh, a bunch of the other, you know, automotive manufacturers have run uh, bounty programs and vulnerability disclosure programs. It became a partnership. So what they did is they changed the way they thought from hackers being something out there to something that they're actually very closely engaged with to make their products safer. And, and you know, cars are harder to hack today as a result of that. The last one, which is which is fun, is is good old IoT. Um, you know, this has just been an incredible space to watch because I think for a, a good chunk of time there, people didn't really know what IoT was, uh, and then all of a sudden it was everywhere, and then all of a sudden we realized that we hadn't really secured it very well in 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 the process. So, you know, the this is not so much research. This was actually a bad thing that happened. Um, the Mirai botnet which went out and took out a whole bunch of, of um, uh, DBRs and, and webcams that had default credentials on them. And then that was used uh, by someone to perform a DDoS. Actually, I think it was a gaming spat. There was some, the backstory of that one's kind of funny, but it, it basically accidentally took down the internet for most of North America in the process. Um, so what happened off the back of that? There was uh, policy around baseline security controls for IoT devices that was rolled out in California first, and then a bunch of other places in North America. That's followed suit into other areas of, of the world. And what we're seeing now is a whole lot of innovation around default by design, like secure by design, uh, IoT you know, development platforms and hardware and, and so forth. That's that's making all of that area more resilient because this is a particular space that, you know, I'll come back to this one as well. It's going to continue to accelerate. So, all right. What do they think of us? Like as as we've got people coming in and and you know creating the bad things that happen, uh, whether they're in in good faith or, or whether it's something like Mariah and it was actually someone doing some, the wrong thing, like what has what has the market thought of us uh, this whole time? So you know this is AKA meanwhile in in business land, right? This is actually a, a parody of the the hack hustle thing that I kind of introduced with. Um, so I'm going to put my suit on now and talk about the view of the world. Pre-2012 and, you know, rip good times is, is a part of this because because I do miss these days when everything was a little bit simpler. Um, occasionally, there's a whole bunch of really good things that have happened too. I think, like, this is really the view that most of, of the internet, including the people that built it, had of hackers. Uh, it's like they, these folk, they, they talk funny, they, they dress funny, they do these weird things with computers. Like, there's some movies about it that I don't really understand. They look cool. They rollerblade a lot, apparently. I'm not sure how that works. Um, but it's it's kind of this abstract, irrelevant thing that's happening over in a corner with a group of people that I don't really understand. So, okay, you know, on you go. It's, it's all good. Um, but then, uh, and this actually happens. I, I, the joke is that I had absolutely no involvement in this, which is true. Um, but it happened at the same month the bug crowd first landed in the United States uh, back in 2013 to, to fundraise. This guy did his thing. Um, so, you know, what the Snowden disclosures did uh, or created as an impact, and this is, by the way, not me advocating uh, in any direction um, what Snowden did. What I'm talking about is the effect that it had was that it made everyone realize at that point in time that hacking is something that is actually relevant to me. And I'm talking about my mother, my my sister, my grandparents, my aunt, my uncle, my uncle. Um, you know, folks that aren't necessarily security folk or technologists, just lay people that use computers every now and then. They realize this is something that actually is relevant to me. Then it got worse. <laughs> so basically, you know, 2014 was the year of the retail breach. So now hacking, like Snowden taught me that hacking happens. Now I know that it happens to me. 
Um, 2015 was healthcare records getting getting pillaged right across the board. Okay, hacking happens to me and it hurts because I can't insure that. The credit card's not going to reimburse my my identity card or, or my healthcare records. Um, 2016 is hacking happens to my country uh, in the North American example with the DNC hacks and all the stuff around election interference. Um, 2017 to 2019 was just a raft of just random stuff like Mariah was in there as something that happened that caught everyone by surprise. It was basically this ascending narrative of like, yeah, this is actually a really important thing for everyone to consider and its impact is universal. It's not just a nerd thing. Um, so, you know, software is eating the world and the bad guys seem to be eating the software, right? 2020 was COVID. And, you know, I think the interesting thing about COVID is that it introduces this idea that, you know, my employee's five-year-old is now part of my threat model. Um, that's a new thing. So, so if a, if a, if a home network is a, is a predictable extension of the corporate network, then all of a sudden you've got, you know, televisions and toasters and, and home routers and whatever else included in a corporate threat model. And that really hasn't been an issue. Um, and it very all like very suddenly became an issue in 2020. And of course, at the end of the year, we had uh, we had the whole issue with SolarWinds and kind of the introduction of this conversation around supply chain attacks, which is a whole other talk. Uh, I won't go into that too far now. But you see the point. Like, there's all of these things that are just kind of ascending in their narrative to uh, to you know basically explain to the market why we do what we do, right? So given the fact that um, it's such a common conversation, you know, really what happens and what I've seen, it's part of the reason I started Bug Crowd in the first place. If things get repeated enough at the dinner table, they end up making their way into the boardroom. Uh, and what that does is it drives basically focus from the organization. It drives the deployment of money into, into being able to do security better. It drives security as a higher priority, um, which, you know, is awesome, right? Like the folks that have been in security for longer than, than the time period that I just uh, just laid out, that's a huge win because because really we've been sort of standing on the street corner, um, screaming at people, trying to get them to care for, for quite a long time. And all of a sudden we've got this this help of, of you know what people are already thinking about. Um, in 2021, I think the question that we all need to be asking ourselves, and this goes to, to really the core of the talk and the recommendations I'm gonna drop at the end here, uh, you know, now what? <laughs> Um, for those of you who've seen this movie, Finding Nemo, uh, this group of fish are stuck in a fish tank for the, basically the entire movie. And at the end of it, they break out, they, they kind of roll across the street in these bags and they land in the ocean. So great, like awesome success. We've made it. We've done the thing that we wanted to do, which I think is kind of similar to how security feels at this point in the market. We've actually gotten people to pay attention. Um, now what? <laughs> They're still in these plastic bags. They've still got some more work to do. So... What I'm going to go through is um, is really from a skills development standpoint and how to how to think about that or how to identify opportunity and think about it as someone who's contributing into that. Some of the things that you can you can do to answer like now what. Um, this is a theory that I that I throw out there a lot. <clears throat> it, I I I blurt out the swear words. Um, I'm Australian, so we swear a lot. Uh, but I wanted to be respectful in 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 that. But it's you know called the oh crap theory for 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 a better way of putting it. So if speed is the natural enemy of security, then the rate at which a new technology category comes to market predicts how quickly and badly its oh crap moment is going to be. So basically, the faster something lands, the faster something gets adopted. Generally, the more severe it's like oops, we forgot to secure that moment um, is. And generally, the sooner it comes as well. So when you're thinking about skills development and when you're thinking about how to differentiate yourself, when you're thinking about, you know, what are the things that are going to be valuable that I can add to what I'm doing now to actually firm up the things that I'm going to be able to do going forward, it begs a pretty interesting question. Like, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Is there, you know, an area of technology that is of incredible interest to you that's just kind of popped up um, that you expect to see cause a lot of problems down the track that you can actually start to get ahead of in terms of how you're directing security research. This is why I started off with all of these, these sort of bad things and research pieces, because this is where I do believe we get to not only you know, build careers out and make money and feed the family and all of those great things, but actually have a tremendous impact on progress. Um, yeah, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do not follow the path set by others. Instead, make your own path and leave a trail. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting 
way to think about it with respect to you know just this opportunity that's come up over the past eight or nine years with with crowdsourcing with kind of distributed connection of talent to opportunity don't necessarily jump straight into being someone who does the same thing that everyone else is doing like that's a good thing if there's a lot of that opportunity there but then starting to think about what your own things are and developing those i think is a really smart way to do it honestly that's how i built built my career um it was it was really getting in behind you know people and, and folks that would help me along mentors like my community all of that kind of thing but then working out what that little that little bit that was just you know special to to me in terms of my own interest and what i was able to pursue that's a lot of how i've done what i've done in the past so so clearly i'm, I'm a fan of the idea um and really what it nets out to is what is like crossed out going to catch fire next um what skills should i start building and we'll we'll uh we'll finish up here and we can go to q a as well um <clears throat> so coming back to it hardware and iot uh it's not slowing down um I, you know i think the thing that's happening with with hardware and iot is is this property of convergence that's kicking into place um it, it used to be you know linux and busybox sitting on an arm chipset with some radio and if you knew that then you could do iot now you've got you know a car that talks to a smart city over an api with a cloud backend and there's this whole kind of ecosystem component that's very strongly being overlaid on top of IoT that the more of that you understand, the more you'll be able to um, to speak to it effectively and actually be productive in, in, in doing security research and all those things around it. And also, I think forming a crew, um, you know, what we've seen with car hacking uh, as, as, a, as a prime example is there's often you know, one person who really understands cars, one person who really understands embedded security, then another person who gets radio and another person who gets web and infrastructure. And they work together as a team, depending on which piece of, of the kill chain they're trying to get sorted out at a given point in time. So just thinking like that in terms of how you how you work with your peers. Um, you know, COVID, as I mentioned before, COVID um, has really triggered uh, a, you know, a shift in bad guy thinking around how to attack a corporate environment. Um, you know, one of the things that's, that's happened is that, uh, you know, zero day for, for IoT, uh, zero day for home routers, that stuff's been around forever, but no one was buying it because it wasn't super interesting. And all of a sudden people started buying it about halfway through last year, which to me suggests that yeah, we're, we're seeing some active exploitation in the wild, which will actually drive more investment and more interest into this space. Um, here's a suggestion for, for a really good primer. If this is something that interests you, like if you're already in this space, go nuts. Uh, if it's intriguing to you, like start to try to find the places where you can actually insert yourself and learn some more stuff. All right, next one. Cryptocurrency to the moon. <clears throat> yeah, seriously. Like I, I, I trash talk. Um, blockchain and, and cryptocurrency a fair bit because I think, um, you know, I, I was around for like the very early beginnings of it when it was super heady and not actually generating value in the way it is today. And I still feel like there's elements of it that are a bit absurd, um, but we're starting to figure out how to use it. And, and that's the thing is that it's not going to go away. So, you know, smart contracts as, a, as an area, that's, re that's really an extension of AppSec, but it's thinking about how uh, immutability gets written into stuff that's ultimately the product of the application. Uh, cryptocurrency exchange security, actual cryptography. That's a really, I think there's not a lot of people really getting into trying to study that right now. And, and it's an area that's going to become pretty relevant, especially as quantum starts to kick in and we start to have to think about cryptography differently. That's a, that's a really, um, there's a gap there, I think, if, if that's something that interests you. Uh, machine learning, um, it's everywhere, man. Like ML is one of those things that, that really frightens me. And, and this is why I was trying to re like create a um, example of where that's gone wrong that goes so far back. Because if you talk about machine learning as this you know, potential security threat, people just sort of throw it out to you know Terminator thinking or, or whatever else and you can see them in the background there. Um, but the reality is that uh, the exploitability of machine learning models is not a discipline that really exists um, right now. It, it's it's very small, but when you think about how much machine learning we're actually relying on, uh, you know, even like the selection of which panel is at the top of my screen right now, that's driven by an ML model in some ways. Um, there's all of these different things that come into it. And the question becomes, if these systems are relying on untrusted user input, ding, 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 we've seen that before with AppSec, right? It doesn't tend to go all that great. Um, 
how can you reliably manipulate that to create an outcome that you want, but the actual user doesn't? That's what a bad guy might want to do with, with ML. And that was the example from the, uh, the flash crash of 2010. Uh, most people don't really know what it's actually doing. I think a lot of the time when I've seen uh, ML get implemented, uh, it, it, it kind of goes back to that builder breaker priority piece that I was talking about earlier on, where the builders are just trying to get the thing to work, right? They're not as focused on trying to get it to do all, all of the stuff that it shouldn't. Uh, and that's where we come in. Um, Insider PhD has done a, a great talk on this. Um, the DEF CON AI village uh, and their Slack and Discord is, is kind of a diaspora of people that are really digging into this type of thing. The other piece with ML is um, I think COVID has had a pretty strong impact on you know, what privacy means. Um, and this is where you know, facial recognition and all of those sorts of aspects start to come into play. And we did a whole bunch of that stuff really quickly. So I think looking back on that over time um, to figure out like, where was that fragile? What do we need to be thinking about from a from a cybersecurity standpoint to make sure that privacy is preserved? Um, that's going to be a pretty interesting space as well uh, for you uh, for you privacy zealots in the, in the group. Um, APIs they're already going crazy. Ten, uh, COVID's ten x that I think um, mostly because you know organizations this drove a lot of work for Bug Crowd in in the past year. You've got you know, banking customers who've relied on a branch historically, and all of a sudden branches don't really exist because everyone's locked down. Um, so what that did was force digital transformation projects that they were maybe maybe going to do over three years. Um, all of a sudden they're doing them over the next you know couple of months. Uh, APIs play a really key role in that, and that's happened everywhere, right across the internet at this point in time. Um, the relationships between the different systems are almost always weaker than the hosts themselves. With people doing API testing, often they approach it like it's a web target, um, and the attack surface is a lot, a lot smaller. So it's actually harder to kind of hit up from that angle. If you think about it as part of an ecosystem, that's often where the really bad stuff falls out. So that's just a little tip there, um, and a lot of people are really needing security input here at the moment. So um, the JROC talk on, on the level up stream is a good one for that. Um, bonus round, uh, old code, like seriously, it, it, there's there's stuff that's hanging around that's not cool to learn necessarily. It's it's not Go or you know Ruby or, I mean, Ruby's, I'm dating myself by calling Ruby out in that list, but you get what I mean. It's not one of the, the code du jour languages that everyone's learning. The fact of it is the Java still runs like 24 odd percent of, of, of the um, ASP.NET is, is 21 percent. I think there's a really interesting gap in terms of um, COBOL and some of these lower language, uh, lower level um, kind of mainframe languages, because the reality is that the people that wrote that stuff are actually aging out. They're, they're retiring, they're you know, going off and doing other things. The, the population that's actually available to even understand COBOL in the first place, let alone like approach it from a breaker mindset is thinning out uh, at the moment. And like the reality is the COBOL is going to probably outlive, you know, the heat death of planet Earth. It'll, it'll just be like a mainframe running COBOL floating around in space. So this stuff is going to continue to exist and need security input and need people to help with it for a really, really long time. And there aren't a lot of people that can do it anymore. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting gap there. Um, and it's kind of, in, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting language to learn as well. So I'll just leave it at that. Otherwise I'll get ranting about COBOL. We don't want to do that. Um, you know, bringing it back to how to think about it and, and potentially how to like double down. And again, this is like, y'all have been crushing this over, over the past eight years, as I mentioned before, like what I'm talking about right now is how to take some of that stuff to the next level. It's the same kind of input that I'm giving in a lot of different places at the moment, just around, you know, the acceleration of security and how the hacker community can, can actually step up into that and being a meaningful part of it. Um, really what the CISO is, is asking, going back to the Nemo kind of now what slide is, I, how do I make security useful to my business? I don't want to just hear about bugs. You know, I don't, I don't want to just spend money on, on, you know, blinky light things and, and tools and whatnot. I actually need to figure out how to integrate this into my business and make it a part of the overall structure of what we're doing for our customers, not just doing to prevent the bad guys from getting in. So from their perspective, really their world is this, they've got to balance out between management of business and finance risk, management of, of the political risk, which is like communicating security internally and externally out to the market as a part of that. And then like that one piece is the technical side, which is most of what we've talked about, 
but I wanted to just touch on this at the end here to to you know frame up a, a mental model that might be useful in, in terms of how you think about you know, pursuing opportunity going forward. So what that means is for us as a community, you know, we need humility. We need to actually understand that as we're going to these folk, we've got things that we know that they don't, but the opposite's also true. Um, so as as we do that, what I see happen, and this is something that you know I honestly think I had to learn um, midway through my career. Once I started to activate this, everything accelerated because all of a sudden we were working on the same goals. It wasn't it wasn't adversarial anymore. It was principle. And I think humility is a key part of that. Empathy for for you know what's going into um, not just securing the system going forward, but how it got there in the first place, because uh, that again comes into this sort of spirit and attitude of partnership where you get to just be more valuable. You literally just get invited to give more input, be more valuable, be more an integrated part of what's going on. I think that's really powerful. And of course, skill, which is what we've just been talking about. I think finding clear air and working out you know, where you can like continue to, to, to pursue the things that are coming over the next hill, um, I think it's a pretty pretty good investment of time. So to summarize, breakers drive innovation, which creates opportunity. The market for that oppor opportunity is ripe and it's expanding globally. Like you all in this group know that already. But what I'm telling you is that we're only just getting started. This is this is just the beginning think, of, of the market's understanding of how to consume security and how to actually partner with the hacker community to make the internet a better place. Um, the scarcer your knowledge, the more valuable it becomes, which is why I was kind of pointing off towards these like weird areas that are about to blow up. Um, I think that's part of the reason for doing that is that that's, those are the things that are gonna be incredibly valuable uh, as you go forward. Um, and as you're doing this, don't just be valuable, like work to understand the business and actually create value. Because the more you can be doing that, the more you're escalating yourself from just having a technical conversation to now starting to interface with 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 the overall company um, or companies or you know the entire internet itself. Like the internet is a product of it being a business. So the more you can you can work with that idea and not just the technical ones, I think the more effective and the more rewarding, frankly, it is um, in in the future. So. That's me coming to an end here. Uh, the shout out is to join us on our Discord. Um, not now, because you got a conference to attend. Um, but uh, we'd love to see you in there. Uh, you know, once you get around to that, um, you know, Luke's in there, uh, Michael, myself, all, all of the Bug Crowd crew, and a bunch of hunters from around the place. So, really appreciate again the opportunity to come and chat. And hopefully, I've encouraged you all uh, and and you know, communicated my gratitude for all of the incredible input in years given to to not just Bug Crowd, but the state of the internet itself over the past eight years. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Casey, so much uh, for this amazing uh, presentation. I have received a few questions. Uh, uh, I sure. would like to read them out to you. Uh, right. You've mentioned about uh, the lock. Uh, the first buck bounty was, I think, some lock in the ancient histories. I do not know when a <laughs> bunch of people were asked to come and break the lock. So, uh, so I'm just rephrasing that, paraphrasing that question. Who sure. was your first client and how did you convince them when you started Buck Crowd? Wow. Yeah. So the first client uh, was a company called Packet Loop. Um, one of the founders of that company is actually now the CISO of Canva. Um, but he was, he's a security guy. Uh, I was bouncing the idea for Bug Crowd off him at a conference in Australia about six months before uh, starting the business and going for the accelerator. He was like, yeah, that's a great idea. You should, you should totally do that. And I basically said, okay, if we do, you're going to be our first customer. We got a deal and we shook on it and, and he was. So that, that, that was our first. Our second two were um, actually charities. Um, so they came and said, we need security help. And that was when we were trying out the whole charity bounty thing, which was interesting. Um, after a little while, we actually got a deal with Google early on, which was I think our, our kind of early sign that, yeah, this, this is definitely going to be a thing. Um. All right. Uh, the second question is, uh, it's regards to, uh, do you also think there is a possibility of having more patch reward programs rather than people who just find bugs? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, there's There's been a kind of recent trend of people trying to do that <clears throat> with um, with CodeQL. 
uh, and 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 Semmel on on the on the discovery side, but then you know, given that that's mostly involved in open source projects, having that feed out into incentivizing people for a fix, um, what makes that difficult in 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 corporate land is that you know folks are generally fairly cautious about giving people outside of their organization access to their code to do the fix, and and the challenge with with fixing vulnerabilities is that you can make you know the issue that you've discovered go away, but you don't know what else you're breaking in the process. Um, so there's some technical, I think, hitches to, to making that something that everyone does universally, but I do see more people, you know, basically, um, basically uh, trying on stuff like that. And things like the Windows, you know, the Defender, I forget the exact name of it, but the, uh, the mitigations bounty that Katie started up uh, a number of years ago at Microsoft. Yeah, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be hands-on code. Here's something that you can just go deploy to production. It's like here's an approach that you can take to mitigating this that you might not have thought of before. Um, starting to see more of that sort of stuff. Really, that's a that's an awesome question because I think I think that whole idea around not just thinking about how to break things but how to improve them as well. Like that's the second order impact of a lot of the stuff that we were just talking about, and I think that's a really powerful thing to be to be thinking about as well. All right. Uh, there are a few questions with regards to suggestions and guide to how to get into bug bounty. Uh, I, I would recommend uh, to answer those questions. Just join uh, the Discord channel of Bug Crowd and yeah, to the team sign, over there. Sign, sign up for Bug Crowd. You've got the you've got the link at the bottom. Um, Bugcrowd.com. Try hyphen Bug Crowd, which is where you can sign up as a as a researcher on the on the platform. And then from there, there's all sorts of different resources. The Discord's a great place to come and chat. So I think if, if there's engagement around some of this stuff, we can do that there as well. All right, we'll take the last question, uh, Casey. Sure. Is bug bounty reaching a saturation point, especially with web application bug hunting? <sighs> wow. Um, what is bug bounty is 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 usually my, my flip of, of that question. I think, um, <clears throat> You know, my personal opinion, uh, and, and, and one that's fairly strong, is that <clears throat> vulnerability disclosure programs, in terms of being able to hear when something's broken on the internet, is something that is just going to become normal. Um, it, it, it's, it's a normal part of being on the internet. It's something that everyone should do. I also believe that's not the same as a bug bounty program. I think when that gets confused as being like a bug bounty program without cash, um, people are kind of doing it wrong when they position it like that. So um, just calling that out. I think bug bounty in terms of going out to the open internet and saying, come hack my stuff, I'll pay you, is not necessarily appropriate for every organization because they don't necessarily have the ability to do anything with that information, right? So from my perspective, you know, VDP is a ubiquitous thing. Then you've got all these things like private programs and, and you know, programs where there's more control. Over, over how you're like learning about your stuff, getting better at fixing it, getting better at not being vulnerable in the first place. Um, I think there's a huge, you know, a very wide open scope for, for work there. And that looks more like crowdsourcing. That's less of a bug bounty thing and more of a crowdsourcing security thing. So that's why I always get tripped up on, on the use of terms there. So that was probably over the top as an answer. Um, I think um, there's a lot of web stuff and, and, and there always will be. I, I, I think the web, you know, either in, in, in full form or via API is here to stay as a way, you know, technology talks to itself and the way that we talk to technology, which suggests there's always going to be more opportunity to give input into that space. That said, there are a lot of people doing it. Um, and it is more, I think, difficult to, to find a way to compete and pop out as someone who's a, who's an expert in that particular domain. So yeah, I know saturated, I think is strong. Um, it's definitely the most populated uh, aspect of, of of security that we see from from an offensive testing side. So maybe that's a better answer. All right, Casey. Thank you so much for this amazing keynote.